LDA part 3. So uh, let me do a quick uh, logistics first, right? So schedule. We have homework 5A due now, I think, as in today or tomorrow or something like that, plus demos later. Homework 5B due roughly at the end of next week. So we have a lecture on Tuesday. I believe that is uh, November 30th or 29th on Tuesday. Anyway, I think that's due Friday. Friday next week. Uh, let's say it's 12th, 5th. Um, that that's a uh, that's not easy. I'm gonna be I'm gonna I don't wanna scare you guys before the big holiday, but I'm just gonna say homework five A easy. Okay. No big problem, just run rouge and evaluate the summaries. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it's an easy fix for it. Five B is a bomb. So that's gonna be hard. And homework six uh, due I think after exam. Uh, that's that's a different thing. Uh, I think that's uh, 12, 14 or so. I don't know. But uh, no late demos because we're out of time. So that one you have to demo by the due the, the, because the term ends. Uh, exam is on Tuesday. I think it's a 13, right? Yes, 10 is a Saturday, 11 is Sunday. 12 is a Monday, right? Uh, it's six hours in class. The question is, we start, I think they fix the room, we can start at 12 p.m. or at 2 p.m. So we'll run a piazza poll to see when people want to start. Uh, most people said they prefer 12, so we can start at 12, but if some people say, no, we want to start at 2, then we'll have to figure it out, but we have the rooms. And the term ends Friday, uh, 12, if that's a Tuesday, is it 16? Must be, because 3 plus, Tuesday plus 3, it's Friday. Um, but uh, I don't know if we have a class that day. Class, let's say, optional. Uh, the reason I'm not sure is that we may have to deal with a lot of late demos, people who have legitimate, I've been sick, I've been out, that something happened, discussion about the exams, so I'm happy to come to do a class on Friday. It's technically part of the term, the term ends on Saturday. But maybe we use that time for something extra while we still deal with some grading issues. I don't know. OK? That's our plan. Um, so we are at LDA. Uh, here's a, a quick recap of where we are with that. <coughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it somewhere say here so LDA recap so far we want to model um, documents words with two matrices of probabilities so we said uh, matrix A, right here. This is n documents, docs. So it's n times topics. That is k. And here's the other one, which is topics times a large vocabulary. So topics k words, let's say W or something like that. Now, think uh, uh, as an example, think of N being 10,000, uh, K being around 100, and W being like 100,000. So that's a very typical example, 100,000 words, 10,000 documents, or 20,000 documents, maybe 20 news groups, 20,000 documents. 
and roughly 100 topics. Topics are a matter of granularity. I can be more specific with more topics or very broad with fewer topics, right? If I run five topics, they'll be pretty broad. And uh, uh, this is a document. So this is N documents from one to N. This is a document, let's call it D. And this in here, it's uh, phi uh, D one to phi D uh, K. This is a distribution over topics. And this is the topic K, phi, we call it phi K right here. Right, so this is phi K1 up to phi K W. This is a distribution over words. So every document is a distribution over topics. Every topic is a distribution over words. We are not looking for a matrix product in here. I'm going to say very specifically, not a matrix product. Even though it looks like the air matrices, and it looks like the number of columns aligns to the number of rows here, it's very tempting to start making products. We, we're not looking for that linear algebraic product. But we are looking to discover these matrices. Uh, my code calls them A and B. So that's our plan, to discover each document, how to represent the topics and each topic, how to represent it into documents with some criteria. Okay, so here's uh, our um, generative model. Let me rewrite this a little bit concise. Distributions over topics. So here's the generative model. for a document D given A and B. So the generative model says, if you have A and B, here's how you can make new documents. Uh, and we think of that as generative in the same sense like you roll a die to generate a sequence of outcomes, or flip a coin to generate a number of, of heads and tails, or sample people to generate a basketball team. All those generative processes assumes I have some source distributions that can sample stuff or produce outcomes. And via iterations, via a process of certain type, I can produce my outcomes. In this case, we want to produce a document. So let's say document D length is, uh, is say, I don't know, 200 words. And how we do this? Uh, we have a few steps here. First, step number one, we, we, we select, actually the correct word is sample, the doc generator. That's data D, this guy. So that is a probability over topics. So we, in order to get a document, we, we generate something like this. Now how do we get that? We say this guy is sampled from a Dirichlet, uh, it's called a multinomial Dirichlet of some parameter alpha. We discussed these distributions before. This family of functions which is either multinomial Dirichlet or binomial beta. That's the one we've been talking for two classes now. If you start with the proper prior, they have this conjugate prior mechanism, the prior is based on counts. As you see more and more evidence, you stay inside the same family, you just update the counts. That's a nice math in there that says, if you have a Dirichlet or beta, this beta is the case with two outcomes, Dirichlet is the case with many outcomes. That is the same thing. So it's easier to understand the theory for the beta binomial function because you can expand from two outcomes like a coin, heads or tails, to six outcomes, that's a die, or to 100,000 outcomes, which is the whole vocabulary. But the theory, the essential part of theory happens for the two outcomes, so you can just stick with the beta function. So the inter interesting property is two things here that I'm not going to do again because we did it. 
Number one is that the multinomial function is the corresponding to IAD process. If every outcome is essentially repeating the previous process one more time, like a coin flip or a die roll, doesn't matter what I've got. I use the same exact distribution that I fixed for my die. So this theta d is kind of the die probability on faces. This is just saying manufacture a new die. That is the property over the faces or the words. And then roll the die 200 times to see outcomes. But this rolling the die is independent of the previous roll with a fixed distribution. So it's going to create a multinomial outcome simply because I'm repeating a process 200 times with a fixed distribution. That's a Bernoulli process, the simplest one, but there's the multinomial distribution, which has to say with, if you roll this die 200 times, say it's a die with six faces, what's the probability of seeing so many faces? One, so many two, so many three, so many four, so on and so forth. That's certainly a multinomial distribution. We can prove that mathematically if the rolls are IID. And the re that's why we pick the multinomial. The way we pick the Dirichlet is to have a conjugate prior such that when I, when I see the updates, I'm sticking inside the same kind of family function. That's, pure, that's mostly mathematical reasoning. But it has a nice idea that intuitively, this Dirichlet thing, it's a prior of our previous counts. So it's, it's just updating the previous count. So it has a nice interpretation. From, from a prior standpoint. Like prior depends on how many counts you've seen in the past. Updating those counts is essentially say, one more day, I've seen these counts, I'm updating my prior. So I'm not gonna talk about that again. I'm gonna show you a, uh, again that math a little bit on the, on the slides, but the math is already done in previous times. It has to do with that P at the count times the P at the different count, so you just sum up the counts. And that's how this family goes. So I'm picking this this document generator, and then for every uh, word, in many papers, uh, this is called token. I just put it here so you know what it is. It's the word i uh, that's for i equal 1 to 200. Like I'm looking for the words in the document, which one of them? First i. Um, I select a topic, I'm going to call that ZI from the distribution um, this, this generator. Make sure I'm not. I'm pretty sure it's that way. So now I have the generator. This is rolling the die one more time. At the first word, I roll the die. Second word, I roll the die. Third word, I roll the die. So I'm getting this from this distribution. And then select topic. Uh, I'm going to select the word. this distribution. So once I selected the topic, I'm going to go here and say, okay, roll that die. That's a fixed die. So I'm just going to say that's a given thing. Roll that and see what word you get. So notice that for every word, I may get a different topic. But it's possible to select different topics for words one and two and actually generate the same word because two different topics might produce the same word, right? Unless they have a very, very zero, small probability on that word, right? Uh, we also notice that this zi is kind of a hidden variable, hidden, um, sometimes called latent. And if you if you look at it as a random variable, it's kind of like the membership. in soft K means. I mean, 
like. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying uh, it's exactly that. I'm saying this is something that we, if we run the generative process, we're going to know the ZIs. But in terms of the actual outcome, our outcome is document with words. We see the documents. We see the words. We're going to be able to produce this matrix. We're going to be able to produce this matrix. But we cannot be sure what was the ZI that was the topic for the word number five in document number seven. Because they could have been different ZIs that will generate the same word. Even though we have the probabilities, we have that document, we have the words, exactly what is the topic that was produced in this step in generating that word in that document? So imagine a document like this is one, two, three, this is I, <coughs> up to 200. I can see the words, but I'm not sure what is the topic that was used here. We assume the documents, whatever the corpus is, sonnets or 20 news groups or spam base or whatever, was generated that way. Of course, this is not correct. Documents are not generated this way. Like emails or 20 news groups or even 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 fake text it's usually not generated like this there's there are constraints between words right they not nobody ro runs a die and rolls that die independently we're just assuming that's the model so that's where we are assuming we've done the math part that says if you pick that D initially from a directly that's a that's a that's a uh, prior to this distribution and as you you see the updates you can update that distribution so assuming that math is done that's the generative model now of course we want to reverse this model we're not trying to say give an a and b generate 20,000 documents we want to do the opposite we say if i give you 20,000 documents what are the a and b the generators reasonable generators for that set so that's, that's what we want. Uh, OK. So now, um, let me move the screen a little bit. <coughs> so what's our plan here? Um, our plan is effectively. Um, Let, let's see, LDA, which is reverse the generative process. Uh, that is uh, given docs with words produce the A and B matrices. That's what it is. Uh, what we're going to do is to start with AB as prior counts. So that's effectively, uh, by count, I mean uh, non-normalized distributions. So I'm, I'm going to look at these distributions over, over, this is over topics, and that's over words. I'm going to say I'm going to start with some distributions, but these are, I don't want to normalize them. I'm going to keep them unnormalized because every row in here has to sum to one. Every, every row in here has to sum to one. If I put a bunch of counts, it's easy to see what that distribution is. Anybody can divide by the sum and get the distribution, right? So here's how I'm going to start. I'm going to start with some AIJ, let's say ADK. Uh, ADK is the, the count of topic K in document count of topic K in doc D, right? And this is B, uh, K, W um, is a count of the word W in topic K. Now, I don't have any counts because I don't have topics. I'm just going to make a uh, initial, uh, I'm going to assign all of them to some values. The higher the counts are initial, the stronger the priorities. 
So I'm going to do uniform. I think my code initializes every row here with twos and every row here is with fives. You can play with those constants, right? Uniform distributions. Uniform means the whole row is the same. It's just a matter of how, how strong the prior is. Now, of course, if you, if you normalize it, every row look exactly the same. Because if it's uniform, there's only one uniform distribution with k things. But I'm keeping unnormalized. And I'm going to leave it unnormalized all the time because I want to distinguish different prior strengths. Higher counts will be stronger priors. So I'm going to start those with prior counts. Uh, by the way, the nodes call these, just to, just to uh, not get uh, lost, I think this is sometimes called NDK. And this is some cards or NKW. So if you see those notations, is the number of occurrences we have in there. Now, let, let's just call that. So A, sometimes A, D, K is called N, D, K is the number of uh, times topic K is selected or sampled for doc D. And the way I want you to think of this is actually NDK, which is the, the evidence plus the alpha K, which is the prior. So even though those matrices would live with us in terms of the algorithm, initially this NDK is just the alpha K, the prior. That's prior of alpha. And in here, initially, NKW is, uh, I think, beta uh, W, the prior. But in general, the counts we're going to have, may maybe the right thing to do to not get you confused is A, maybe it's better this way, ADK is NDK. That's the evidence plus the alpha k. That's the prior. Let's do it like that. So this is NKW. That's the evidence, the actual sample. When I start sampling, plus beta W. That's the prior. So I initialize them with alpha and beta. So initial the B K W is N. K W number of times word W is selected sampled for topic K, which is N K W again adds evidence plus beta W prior. So initially, um, initially we have. A, D, K is just alpha K, um, the, that's the alpha vector, which is alpha K, alpha K, alpha K, uniform, and B, K, W is the beta vector, which is beta W, beta W. A D, that's a vector, B K, it's a vector. So this is the A D vector. And this is the B K vector or theta. C V K vector. Alright? Now um, in here when we sample, uh, we we need what's called sufficient statistic. Not all processes have this, but this one does. It says that this particular random variable that you can get uh, gives you everything else. You don't need to worry about sample other things if you sample this one. And that is ZI. ZI uh, given document D 
and uh, all other samples. So the ZI again is the topic for doc for word I in doc D. Um, so what we're going to have here is um, we need all topics. So that's some sort of probability of, let's say, z here. I'm going to call it like the integer set. z is uh, all zi. I guess it's all ZIDs because it's for every document, for every position, all the topics. Those are, those are indicators. ZID is be topic number six, topic number two, topic number three. So there's a lot of topics. There's like D documents times so many words. That, that's a lot of topics, right? So we need this, this uh, sample all topics, the Z set, uh, from a joint distributions. That's impossible. It's just a daunting task to do it that way. So instead, uh, we do some process similar to these chicken and egg problems that we've seen before. Instead, we do a round robin. Sample uh, a particular ZI D for a document. Um, from the conditional distribution of zi given the d uh, given the words that you've seen and given the initial parameters this alpha beta those are init params so they have to do with priors but this and W's is the documents and the, this the document ID and word is the words that we've seen in these documents. So instead of sampling all the topics, we do a round robin kind of thing. We sample one of them and then we update what we need to update and then we move to the next one, we sample, move to the next one, we sample, move to the next one, we sample. So this round robin, it's going to be a repetition of, uh, it's kind of like, uh, Four, like let's let's try here. How does round robin work? Four round r equal one to I don't know one thousand. Four document equal one to uh, you know the whole d at the end, right? I guess that's the document. Four i equal 1 to the document length, right? So this is the rounds of doing it. This is going over every document. This is going in that document over all the words in that document. We have to uh, do a little bit of setup here, maybe. Uh, then we have to sample zi it's ZID really because it's for that document from a distribution that we have to prepare it first that is the ZI probability ZI given uh, everything else all other Z's uh, the document the words alpha beta everything else we have so that's the conditional distribution what is the probability for a particular topic given everything else the way you have it? And then update. We'll update matrices A and B. And so we have this. Oops. That's effectively our plan. We, ZI is a sufficient statistic because we don't need to sample anything else. In other processes, not this one, 
especially because it's a multi-layer sample this, then sample that, then sample that, we may need to do different kinds of sampling. But in here, if we can put our hands on the topic ID for a given document, for a given word, that alone can generate everything else. We don't need to sample other things. So in statistics, that's called sufficient statistic. In our process, it's called a collapse sampling because instead of sampling two or three things, we can just sample that one thing and we'll update everything based on it. So that's a simplified Gibbs. This, this is called the Gibbs here. That's very general. It's not just for this. Gibbs sampling is saying you want to sample a joint distribution, say x1, x2, up to xk variables. From here, you, you do round robin of sample xi from a conditional distributions of xi given all other x's and you repeat it a bunch of times and uh, the outcome that's the Gibbs theorem outcome will look as sampled from the joint so that's uh, not applying just to this process in general, if you want to sample a joint distribution of things, it may be easier to sample the conditionals, if you can compute them, that is, and if you sample enough times. It's not, it's not like the first you know, one sample of you know, 100 things. So if I can generate a sample from the joint, so I have to compute those conditionals, the Gibbs theorem says in the end, the, from the conditionals in the end, it's going to look like the joint. Pretty nice thing to know. Sometimes the conditional look okay, but the joints are pretty difficult. In here, we know for sure the joint is going to be an impossible thing. The joint distribution of 20,000 documents against 100,000 words is just an impossible thing to do. But maybe if we do the conditionals, if we can compute those conditionals somehow, then we can just apply, apply this round robin thing and sample the Z's. Now, keep in mind the Z's are hidden, like we don't need to output the Z's. Uh, think of Z's as some, some belief in what might have happened there. We, we, Z's are discrete variables, so Z indicates the topic ID, that is in this document in position number five, I selected topic number three. And then because we're doing it many rounds, next round might be a different topic selected there. And then a different one, and a different one. Maybe that one will repeat. And if we do it enough times, in the end, we can put our hands exactly on a particular ZI. We can never say this, I'm concluding that the topic ID here must have been three. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to find the right distribution. Okay, we don't know what topic it was. But after all this sampling back and forth, we think there's a much higher chance of being three than seven. So when we update all these counts in A and B, at no point we're gonna know for sure what the distribution is in there. What we're gonna have a better, better sense of is the distribution of the document over the topics and the distribution of a topic. We're gonna know for sure, hey, this topic seems to be more concentrated on a particular stuff, subset of words. Like I give you that example with World War II, we're going to notice, aha, uh -huh, there's a topic here that relates a lot to World War II. And the, the more we train, maybe those topics become more differentiated from each other. But these ZIs that we keep sampling during the Gibbs process, uh, the final values are not necessarily the values. Because if we sample one more round, they're going to change. Right? The memberships could change from three to six and then back to three and back to six. So we can say, okay, like, chances are that was a three or six, more likely, not some other topic ID, but ZI is a random variable. So even though we sample them, we sample them with the purpose of after sampling enough times, we get the handle on Z distribution. It's not for the purpose of some convergence. Don't expect the ZIs to be deterministic 
some fixed values. Just like in the mixture, if you remember, we can play with that mixture. There was a ZIK in there. What component generates, uh, what component K generates what data point I? And even if we do it repeatedly until convergence, that ZIK will not, the property is not going to be 100%. We know it came from that component unless that component was the only thing that could generate. But in a mixture, we always going to have a probability distribution over it. could have come from that component or that component. That's the same with a patient that has a certain symptom. Say, you may have diabetes or a heart problem, but we, we're not sure, you know. So the purpose of the sampling is not to identify ZI as explicit values, because that's impossible. We, they're hidden. We're never going to find the actual exact values. But if we sample enough time and A and B becomes convergent to some distributions, we're going to get a sense that that word likely has been generated from topics 3 or 6 or 9, but not from topics 1 and 4 and 5. Two questions. One, what, is that small alpha and beta, are those coming from A and B? So as we update A and B, we also use them to sample again in the future? Alpha and beta? Yeah. So alpha is the initial, don't think of Dirichlet function, think of counts. Mm -hmm. Alpha is the initial counts that you're willing to put here. Yeah. My code puts a two, 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 two. So two, we're not two. gonna update those as we go. No, alpha, okay. beta are fixed. And there is a way to, to get, to tune for hyperparameters. But we're not doing that. Right. You just put some from your own. And beta, I think my code does five, 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 five. Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do as we sample, we're going to update those counts. But we're not changing alpha and beta. What we're changing is the entries in these matrices. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you how in a moment. But the alpha, beta, the price, we're not changing them. There so are ways to change them, but we're not doing that. So as we iterate <coughs> through this loop, are, is the like distributions that we're sampling from changing or is it static? The distribution is changing, this conditional, because alpha, beta are fixed. Right. D is fixed. Ws are fixed. But the other topic samples are not. There are a lot of topics for a lot of documents. Okay. And as you sample them, the set of the previous sample is changing continuously. That's happening all Gibbs sampling. As I sample more and more, notice this, all other Xs, that's changing because I keep sample. So next round, there's more Xs already sampled. Okay. So my conditional distribution will change in those Zs. And you're about to tell us how that happens. Yes. Okay. And other question. Um, how do like how does like Panzer Tank and Hitler end up in the same topic as we do this? Right, so that has to do with co-occurrences and with the fact that documents that talk about Hitler likely also talk about tanks. Right? They not, they, 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 if a document talks about tanks, it's likely to talk about Hitler. And if it talks about Hitler, it's likely to talk about but tanks. But like, how does that get into the, the B matrix? So you have to think of those as, a, as, a, as a connected to each other. They, you can't separate A and B. Okay. Like you can't. You can't, if, if, you give, if you give me one, I can probably compute the other one, exactly. So what happens here, if a document is fixed to have a distribution and some, some docu a particular document ends up more with a higher probability on topic five, mm -hmm. then whatever words oh. are in that topic five uh -huh. will appear in all other documents that have a high value on topic five. So there's a kind of like uh, two hooks that are, are uh -huh. continuously working each other. If, if, if this document has a high probability on topic five, keep in mind that this sums to one. So it has to have some high probability on some topic. It can't be you are nowhere, buddy. You have to give it some. So you give it that topic. It talks about Hitler. Then the, 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 there's a property of a words here. Any other document that talks about Hitler must have a high probability on the same topic five. But any other document that talks about Hitler also talks about tanks, which forces topic five to have high probability on tanks. Yeah. That's not exactly what it is, mm -hmm. but it does make sense as a yeah. common sense explanation. Mm -hmm. There is two hooks that are acting between A and B, and we don't want to separate those, because if you fix one, you can probably compute the other, and that might not be the best breakup. We want to keep updating both of them. So ZI 
is what holds the whole thing together. If I sample a new topic for a new word in a document, and instead of say the previous topic right there was topic five, and I sample topic seven now, I have to make an update on both A and B. So you'd be amazed, now after what, two lectures and a half, how easy this and this is. You'll be like, I cannot believe after five hours this whole thing could be that easy, the setup and the update. I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely unbelievably easy at the very end of the, when you see the script, the LDA, the pseudocode, okay, how can it be that easy? What the only thing that we need to do is to subtract. If say I'm looking at a, a new positioning, I, I'm in a document, I'm in a particular position, so I'm in document D in position 12. Say I'm resampling that topic ZI. So let's say in here when I sample the ZI, I have old ZI, I'm gonna call it ZID old. As an example, I'm going to say that's a five, and the new ZID, call it new, say that comes a seven. What do you think I'm going to do here? So I'm in a document, I'm in a certain position, D and I are fixed. I resample somehow, well, that, that's the hard part. This conditional is the hard part. But say I sample somehow, I see there, oh, you have a five, that's topic number five in that spot. So in that document was topic number five, who generated, I also have that, that the word, the word didn't change, right? The word WI is the same. The actual word in that position, if it was tank, it's still tank. Uh, the word didn't change in the document at position 12. So now I resample a topic and I get, what, seven instead of five. What do I do here? Keep in mind that those are unnormalized, are counts. And we want to keep them as counts. Whenever we need to normalize them, we're going to normalize them then as a, as a runtime operation. We're not going to normalize them specifically be, because we want them to reflect counts. Hint, updates very easy. Okay. So I go to that document. These are counts. I go to topic number five, the old one, and I do what? Louder, please. Decrease by one. Decrease by one. Because that topic was there, but it's not there anymore. I'm replacing that topic number five in that position. Position doesn't matter. It, we treat documents of bag of words, so the fact that it's position 12 or position 19 doesn't really matter in a bag of words. It will matter in LSTM to keep track of the actual positions, but we don't. Every word for us is just a bunch of counts with words. We don't know the order. So the position I doesn't really matter, but the word in that spot matters. We need to know what word we're talking about. The word tank. It doesn't matter the 12 word or the 15 word or 19 word. So what do I do? I go in topic, so I'm in document D. I go in topic number five. I decrease by one because I'm replacing that sample. And then I go to topic number seven and I? Add one. Add one. Why do you decrease by five? I thought we were doing by this one. again and again. Or why do you decrease five by one? I five is the topic ID. Right. But like So I had it sample seventeen times. I'm saying, well, I'm replacing that with seven, so instead of seventeen it's only sixteen times now. These counts are gonna keep track how much I sample that topic. So if I looking at a word and I say, Okay, it's not five anymore, it was five, it's seven now, it means being Five topic five was sample one less time, and topic seven was sample one more time. So, too, I know too you're easy. About to tell us. Sounds too good to be true. But like, how is what's <laughs> how is a like a emerging is a distribution over topics. Yeah. And we keep it as counts. Yeah. That is how many times you've seen that topic in that document. Right. So what's What's getting better every time? Like, how is A getting better? <coughs> we just like, it seems like we just erased all our progress from the previous iteration if we do that. Remember, we're doing one at a time. So we're looking at document in a position, and we say, given everything of that sample, what would be 
the right sample for this for this let's not say the word the spot 12 because the 12 the, the spot doesn't matter this word in this document the word tank now because I resampled everything because it's a round robin mm. everything else presumably got better somehow so if I sample now for that word I'm gonna get my distribution over topics has changed so I'm still sampling I'm not picking the R max I'm not picking the topic with a maximum probability but my distribution has changed so if I resample I'll get a better topic than I did before but sampling will take some time to swallow if you haven't done statistics and specifically sampling sampling is a thing that will take a while so my recommendation is for students in the data science uh, master uh, computer science is to pay a little bit more attention if you can to statistical and sampling processes if you don't want to take a class that would be ideal every time you hit those things sample statistics p-values t distributions you name it maybe it makes sense to put a little bit more time because i think we under teaching them overall be extremely useful in so many places to know more about statistics and sampling even at the undergraduate level i think that's a deficiency uh, so that there's no hope for us to understand sampling in half an hour better that's going to take some time to 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 settle upon but do we understand this simple process with counts remove one count from topic five and add one count to topic seven because i've seen topic seven one more time and topic five one less time that seems very clear again think of this as counts and whenever it need to be distributions, we can divide by the sum and get the distribution out of it. How about in here? I think it's the same thing. Now, this is not per documents. This is overall across all documents, right? And this is not per words. This is over all words. This is documents into topics. That's topics into words. So what happens here? I look at the topic, what, five at word wi there's a word that word here and i say well i'm going to decrease the topic five on this word by one and i'm going to increase the topic number seven on this word by one so the update is pretty simple it's saying a um let's look at the old topic let's say five as i'm going to keep that example <laughs> uh, what is it? A D five minus minus A D seven plus plus. Right, I'm increasing by one, and then B <coughs> uh, five W I minus minus B seven W I plus plus. If if I'm running this example here. you have to agree that this is much easier than what you hoped for, right? I mean, if you, if, when I write this the first time on the board, who expected this to be that easy? There, there was, uh, after all this math, a sense that this is gonna be a monster, it's not a monster. But there is a little monster here. They sample the conditional distribution. What is the conditional distribution? That's a little problem, so we have to figure that out. Uh, now, in terms of the setup, Actually, the decrease happens first. I need to decrease A, D, this is the old topic. Uh, that's A, D, 5, minus, minus. Uh, and I need to do this, B, what is it? Old topic, W, so that's B in this case, 5, W, minus, minus. So, the setup part is do the decrease. I need to do the decrease before I compute the conditional distribution. So in terms of updates, I need to decrease and then increase, but the decrease have to happen before I compute the conditional distribution. I need, I need the counts without this decrease in there. The other thing that happens in the setup is calculate the Gibbs this probability of zi given all else so this conditional 
obviously has to be figured out before I do the actual sampling. Sampling is not difficult. The actual, here's a distribution, how you pick an item out of it. I'll show you some techniques of how to do that. That's elementary. That, that's easy undergraduate uh, operations. The difficult part is how you calculate that distribution. So keep in mind that the decrease happens before we do the calculations, and the increase happens after we get the new topic. And that is LDA. In theory, at least at the end of the day, this A, we don't have to do any post-processing work. At the end of the day, A will be the matrix of counts that we can normalize to get documents as distributions, and B is the matrix of topics that we can normalize if we want to get distribution. So the, the end result of LDA is A and B matrices. We can still apply this to generate a new document as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a side thing. If you want a new document, pick a, pick a generator and do this process. Also, what you might need is once you have the LDA training, LDA training means computing A and B. What if I have a new piece of text? I don't want to retrain my model. My model is fixed. How do I map that new piece of text into, into this? So effectively, it's saying, I know this, this topic model. So each topic is now fixed in stone. It's not changing. Now I give you a new document. How do I obtain my new document will be another row in here. Right? How do I obtain the properties for that document? Without retraining, so I'm not, I'm not changing B or the A for the other documents. Then I have a model. I want to get the probabilities for that piece of text, new text, given that these topics are already fixed. So you're going to need that for the 5A and the summarization. When, when you have LDA trained already, you have the B matrix, but now you have a new summary. So there's a function that says, given the model you have, here's pass that new piece of text through the model. It doesn't change the model. All it does, it produces the probability you need for the new piece of text. So that happens a lot. I train my LDA model on a bunch of books or Wikipedia or whatever I have. But then I have some new piece of text. And I want to know, without retraining, my topics are fixed. What is this new document about? So whatever probability comes up high, that's what this document is about, these particular topics. So we need. To train the LDA, that's one thing. That's doing this. And then ability to say, either generate a new document, or if I have a new document, give me the representation of that document into those topics. <coughs> OK. Ends up with, with me. Are we, are we making progress? Are we feeling better than, say, last time or the time before? Now, there is, of course, a story here, which I'm trying to say as best as I can, it took me many iterations of the course to say the story in a way that like people don't drop. But there's, of course, the implementation, which I don't think is going to be hard, because uh, I'm going to give you a formula for this probability. So then if you implement that formula, updating the counts in two matrices is not that hard. I'm sure you guys can do that very easily. But then there is the math of the whole thing. So you, I think you're going to feel pretty good about the story at the end of this by next week. And you're going to feel pretty good about your implementation and debugging and getting some results. The part that you're not going to feel super good, perhaps, is the math. All this math, multinomial, Dirichlet, conditionals, uh, jeep sampling, you name it. Uh, you know, I think you can feel by the end of the term or by the, the next week, you'll be like, OK, I, I'm really not sure I can reproduce all that math or coming up with it if I need to. I think that's absolutely normal. And like I already said, it's a deficiency not in necessarily how well we did here for two weeks, although I, I can take equal blame with you guys on that. It's not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to, to put blame on others, but it's just math will take more than two weeks to settle. If our deficiency is in, say, linear algebra and statistics and distributions, you have to admit that if we want to make progress on that, it will probably take another course in statistics to do well, or at least a crash course about a month or so. So I wouldn't feel too bad about not understanding all the math, because I think maybe you didn't take a course in statistics, for example. And the right way to do it is to take some Christmas break or some new course at some point, 
on your own or with the school or with whatever and, and then study that more. And I, I think you'll feel a lot better about math after the course in statistics that deal with sampling, that has a sampling module in it. Uh, so we're not gonna be able to do the math perfectly, no matter how hard we try, because we have to do other things. <coughs> uh, it helps that I was a math major when I was in school myself. So that, that turns out to be very helpful on these data science classes. Um, so now what else? Well, we have this distribution here that we have to deal with. And we have the general Gibbs theorem. This Gibbs stands the same like what I just said. I think it's easy to see conceptually that this kind of gonna work out. I'm gonna show you some examples. The actual proof that the outcome looks statistically like sample from the joint, that's beyond the scope of our class. But at least the intuition you should have right. If I can sample from conditional repeatedly, keep in mind that this is changing. The more you sample, the more the, the given part of this distribution is changing. So you have to update it all the time. Then I'm going to end up with a nice sample coming from the joint. It's not always the preferable method. Sample from the joint sometimes is perfectly possible. But sometimes joint is impossible. This is ideal when the joint is hard, but conditionals are easy. That's the moment where deep sampling is gold because conditionals are relatively easy, but the joint will be very difficult. So let's uh, do a few things here. Let's see. <coughs> We're gonna need something like this, two by two confusion matrix. I don't know who wrote it here, but uh, we will need something like this. One of the examples used is this. <coughs> so here's some ideas here. Uh, there's four ideas, and we're not gonna do them in large detail. Um, first of all, here's a notation. Um, Z at minus I, uh, N, something like NDK minus I, like that. Everything that's stuff minus I is the sample count um, so far except for token or, or, or place i. So when you see this minus i somewhere, it means all the samples are high except for that spot. So that's, that's written in the notes. And that's why we need to decrease this before we go into the operations, because we need to take that i out from these counts before we compute. These distributions could be very, very sensitive to some, I mean, the updates we make eventually after a bunch of rounds are going to be extremely small for a large data set. So this, you can say, what well, doesn't matter to take this I out once. If you have a bunch of counts, especially if the number of topics is not big, say I have 10, 10 topics for many documents, for many words. What well, doesn't matter to decrease the count by one? It's not going to do anything. That's true. The distribution with that I included or excluded in it will be very, very close to each other. But because we do it for all documents, for all words, that's what this little, little thing is add up to make a difference. And then we do it a thousand rounds or two thousand rounds. So here's uh, probability of zi. So that's a, uh, this is the small z, so small z, uh, I say small z. This is a particular zid as an id of a topic sample. The big z, say minus i, is all other topics. sample except I. 
the probability of the small zi. I think that's for the document here. Uh, all these um, i's, alpha, beta, w. So this bar is the conditional distribution. This is proportional, proportional to so that's one piece. of words and topics given alpha beta. So this is um, effectively um, it's a sum or if, if you are in a continuous space it's an integral, right? Over, over documents. Because it's saying, what's the probability of seeing a bunch of words and a bunch of topics given just the prior? So it just gets, it gets across all the documents. So when it says across all the documents, it's kind of an integration or, or sum across all the documents. So this is, um, it's either sum or integral. Let's do integral. Although I'm not insisting on this at all. I just want you to see what's about. It's... Uh, Uh, let's do a sum. I don't want to complicate myself with integrals. Overall documents, right? So uh, this is a fancy thing that says, what's the probability of a document? D is a theta D is the document, right? And this phi k is the topic. So what's the probability of picking that document? Remember, the generator is picked from a Dirichlet distribution parameter alpha. And then what's the chance uh, that's the k? Sorry. Well, Z. So this Z here is the set of topics. So that's the chance of a certain sampling of topics given those documents. And this is saying over all the topics you have, that's the case ones. What's the chance of picking the topic from that initial parameter beta? Beta is the original sample. And this is what's the chance of picking the word that you see over that topic. So that's in effect describes the generative process, right? You pick a document, from that document uh, you pick the topics, and from those topics you pick the words. Step number three, uh, this stuff right here, which one do we do first?
this is what we did last time. Then the notes, there is more math here, but effectively saying if you pick the documents from a, from a prior and then you generate topics according to rolling the die for each, for each word, for each location in the document, uh, this we say it's a multi declare distribution that effectively uh, does parameters and dk plus alpha. So that's what we did last time. We say if you start with alpha, and then we notice a certain outcome. This is how many times the die came, faces, or whatnot. This effective says it's like the Dirichlet, but it counts alpha plus what you observed. So what we observe here, again, who's NDK? The number of times no, no, topic K has been sampled for document D. So in, uh, according to our die, rolling the die, is how many times you've seen face number three when you roll this die. A different die, it's a different document. So every document D is kind of like a die. And rolling of that same die 200 times, it's the document that you create the words for it. That sequence of 200 rolls, each one of the rolls, it's a face, that's a topic. So this is the, I think they have a calculation here that says uh, uh, it's Dirichlet, what is it? The, let's call it D of um, NDK plus alpha divided by D of alpha. Where D is, a, D is a distribution that I showed you before. So it's the multi Dirichlet distribution. We're going to leave it at this for that. The last step is uh, W, this other one here. It's the same thing. This will be a multi Dirichlet um, with N. What did we have there? NKW plus beta. Those are the fourth math pieces without the details that are needed to. There's one more piece to compute this conditional distribution. So we, I don't insist on the details. The reason being is, practically, I want to do the, something that's the most useful for you guys next year or next two years. And I'm thinking, even if I force you to learn this math, you're going to forget it by Christmas, right? But I want to give you the intuition so that if you ever need the math, you can spend a week and figure it out. So what we need to keep here to have the flow running we need to understand the pipeline, the principle in the pipeline. We need to understand that this is updating the counts that easy. We need to understand that we can do the join, so we do the Gibbs round robin instead. So we're going to need the conditionals. That's our next step. But then a little bit of setup. This and these are just definitions, effectively. And this, the fact that we get these forms here, it's kind of the math I showed you last time, that if you start with this particular Dirichlet or beta distributions and you add evidence to them, that is what happens when you roll the die, the new distributions are a nice, the same family over counts plus evidence. So the last piece is is where, let's do it here. Probability of zi given all the other z's except i and words and alphas and betas, that's the one we want, that's the Gibbs. Is going to be pwz divide by P W Z without I and that breaks into Z times 
think of it as numerators together, P of W given Z, I mean, that's just base formula. The joint distribution is one times the conditional. And the other one is same thing, P of Z minus I times P of W at minus I uh, given Z minus I. And we need the prior of that word here. So there's two W's. This is the big W vector, all of them. This, uh, this is the whole world. This is that particular world. Let's call it more round. Uh, word in position I. So I'm going to skip the the math here, and I'm going to say this is proportional to n d k minus i plus alpha k. Actually, let me write it in the, I, I think this corresponds to that. So n d k plus alpha k, that's in here. Right? And this is in here, n k w at minus i plus beta w. This is normalized. Uh, over all words, W prime. I'm using this notation so you can follow the notes. So I skip of how this guy becomes here and how this guy becomes here. We need to dig into these formulas here to do that. I'm going to skip that and maybe next time Depending on your interest, we can go over that. But I, I'm much more interested in you having a pipeline with a plan. And trust me for now that those formulas would result in this mathematic derivation. It's only three lines, but it's a lot of factorials and gammas and reductions in there. My point is, if I am to implement this, sample something from this distribution, I need to compute. This is a distribution over what? This is a distribution over all topics, right? This i is uh, from 1 to k, right? It's a distribution over some topic given everything else. But, but this zi, it's different zi's. So, so that's effectively a distribution over all possible zi's. Are we, are we following that? So this Gibbs distribution is given everything else except for that word, that spot, i, I'm at word i, uh, what is the chance, right? This probability is saying, what is the probability of zi being topic one, or zi being topic two, up to topic k, right? This probability is form a distribution of uh, what's the id of topic zi, one, two, three, up to k. So this is a distribution over topics that I need to compute. It's not going to be so bad if k equal 100. In the end, this is 100 numbers. That's sum to 1. That's what it is. It's a distribution over k. It's not over w's. It's not 29 or 50,000. It's just what's the topic. Well, if I have 100 topics, it's going to be a distribution over 100 things. That's sum to 1. Now, the summation to 1, we're not worried about that. The proportional means. Uh, that you can do this and then normalize these this values, whatever you have, right? If it's proportional to something, it means this may not be a distribution. It has to be normalized to get a distribution. So you got to be careful when you sample, these values in here may not sum to 1. So if you're sampling process, that is the next step. Once I have the calculate the Gibbs, if that's not normalized, then the sampling should account for the normalization. Now, how, what is this? How do I get these things? 
I think this is just A DK because my A DK will always gonna be the initial alpha that I put in in the beginning. And then I'm only gonna the count, but this is uh, A DK um, subtract one for uh, for position I, right? Like with what we discussed here. This at minus I, it's after this subtract here. It's like taking, if, if the original topic was five, decrease that count by one in there. And then who's this? This is B K W because B K W it's the N K W plus the beta prior. So beta itself doesn't change it. Uh, but after subtract one for uh, position I at uh, Z, what is it? Z, I, D, alt, Z, no, Z, I, W, alt. And this is position I at Z, I, D, alt. So whatever's corresponding to the old, old ID, I have to take one out from this count, and I have to take one out. That's why this have to happen before I calculate the distribution. And I have to normalize this. <laughs> Normalized over words. This is, uh, in my code, I call this B sum. It just sums the B rows in there. So because I need a normalization, I'm just going to update the B sum. I'll have an additional variable that just keeps track of the sum of the B rows. That's it. If you guys follow this story and implement the algorithm and get some results and play with these counts, I'll be happy. I'm not going to say it's good or bad or useful or not. I'm just saying I'll be happy. Of course, you have to keep in mind that there is a minimum here, and there's so many directions where you can go with this. For example, one direction is you can use EM instead of Gibbs sampling to do this. It's a much more complicated process, but it can work much faster. It doesn't need that many iterations as Gibbs sampling. Gibbs sampling has to do every single ZI for every document so many times. EM has a way to optimize things better. So the MATLAB code that has LDA that I have runs instantly compared to my code who does the thing. Um, then there is the whole math, okay? You need to take every one of these formulas, break it into parts, and that will result in this derivation. This derivation is not so hard if you understand all those four things. So I think the key thing is to get those four in place in order to follow that derivation. And then uh, we can run some, uh, I'll show you a few things here. More than one thing I want to show you. <laughs> so first of all, is this Gibbs sampling working? Um, let me show you the demo here. Some people wrote the package, pretty nice. Not just for Gibbs, for all kinds of Monte Carlo methods. Gibbs is one of them. Um, so I click right here on Gibbs sampling. And uh, what this is doing, let me, let me not doing, uh, it's kind of running by itself, autoplay. So Gibbs sampling, let's do the standard, that's the Gaussian distribution, that's your homework. One exercise in your homework is to say, if I want to sample from a 2D Gaussian, I could do that, of course, from the joint. But I want you to implement Gibbs sampling to alternate x1, x2, x1, x2, x1, x2, based on the conditional distributions. And then to see that that sample that you've got actually looks like a 2D Gaussian sample. Make sense? So if I have a 2D Gaussians, we studied those 2D Gaussians. It's a sigma and mu, two by two, right? I could sample a pair, but instead of sampling a pair from the joint, I'm doing Gibbs sampling to sample alternatively x given y or x1 given x2 and x2 given x1. And overall, that sample will look like sample from the 
Gaussian 2D. That's the Gibbs theorem. In fact, let me show you that first. I'm talking about this problem. Right here. What you need for that, of course, is to compute the conditional distributions of x1 given x2 and x2 given x1, right? Because that's how Gibbs work. So there's formulas for that. For Gaussian distributions, it turns out that conditional are also Gaussians. So all you need is the right mu and sigma. So this math, uh, too hard to follow, does a lot of stuff, okay? Um, nevertheless, we only need this, uh, this final answer here. That's it. The conditional distribution, if x1, x2 are pairwise jointly distributed as Gaussians with mu and sigma, the distribution of x2 given x1, it's a Gaussian function with this mean and this variance. 2, 2 being the cell 2, 2 in the original. Sigma is the original joint uh, variance, and the mu 1 and mu 2 are the means for 1 and 2. So what do you do? You take those, the two of them, because this is x2, x1. You're also going to need x1 given x2, because you have to alternate. And you sample with these distributions, and then, and then um, you produce a sample that way. I think we're going to have some code run next Tuesday about that. And then uh, again, I, I show you this before, this code here. Uh, I think today it's much easier to understand. Alpha, beta, so how I'm initializing the, the A and B matrices. And then all of that is just initialization in here. Uh, this is the B sum that I told you about. I keep track of the B. Uh, across the all the words in there, so I have another variable. It's just summing the b's. For each iteration, that should be pretty close to this one right here. For each iteration, for each document, for each index i in the document, I I first subtract that topic. Like I told you, I have to subtract the old topic from all the counts. So I'm updating a and b and b sum by subtracting the old topic z i is the topic that was in there. I keep track of those topics in a matrix Z, D, I. It's the topic selected for position I in document D. I look at the what ID that is, that the ID of the topic Z, I say five, topic number five. I go on this ID, so I subtract the count. So that's exactly the NB matrices right there. I also update the B sum because that, that needs to be in sync with B. If the something changed, B sum has changed. And then I compute the Gibbs distribution right there, A of D something. So that should be this one. A of D, the whole row, because this is a distribution over all topics. So it's going to be the whole row. It's a dot. That dot operation means multiply every cell with that cell. So it's a cell by cell operation. So it's multiplying this by this. This is a vector overall case. That's a vector overall case. So I'm multiplying every value from here with the corresponding value from there. So the corresponding value from there is B of all K. That's B of, I'm taking a, a particular word and I'm taking a column. All the Ks, all the topics, so that's, it's gotta be a column, right? Because if I fix the word, I'm looking at the column of B. So in MATLAB, it's B of all rows and that word W has to be normalized properly by B sum because I have this normalization here. But then that has to be transposed in order for thing to work because the, the cell operation is vector times vector, every cell with every cell. So that little comma at the end, little, little dot at the end there is taking that and make it a row operation, so the operation works correctly. That effectively corresponds to this derivation right here. This is the derivation we put on the board here, but I skip the middle steps. The middle steps cannot be understood until you understood those four things. Gamma, you should read it as factorial for now. It's a generalization of the factorial. 
but it works on the entire real continuous continuum. So for for it's actually easier to read than it looks because this gamma of a sum is like saying n factorial divided by x1, x2, x3 factorial. So it's it's like combinatorial coefficient in there. Um, it's not that hard to, uh, to understand those gammas. The harder part is this uh, B, which are really the D. They call it B, the beta the Dirichlet distribution. But most, I think, math could be just beta and D, the Dirichlet. So the hard part is the second step. How come those probabilities result in, in, those, in those distributions here? So if you believe me on that, uh, you just need the update, which is written right there in MATLAB. In Python, will look different, obviously, but it's not too bad to compute. And then I'm, I'm, I'm re-updating. I take the new ZI, which is random sample. DST is the distribution that I'm calculating. That's a distribution over k topics. So it's effectively a vector of 100 things. I'm picking a sample from that distribution. MATLAB does it for me, but I'll show you a technique of how to do it. Actually, we talk about technique. Remember with the inverse CDF binary search? So you pick a random uniform value, and then you look into the stair where that random value fits in. It's easy to see that the more big you have a property on something, the more chances are you hit it. And then if you cannot invert the CDF directly, you could do a binary search to look for the value. Um, so there are techniques for how to do this, but many languages if you give them a discrete, it's a discrete distribution because it's k values, k numbers, right? If you give them a discrete distribution, there is a function that gets you one of them with according to those probabilities. So then I'm updating my count. I'm saying that new one has to be incremented by one because I've seen it one more time. And everything, but everything I decremented for the old topic, I'm, I'm incrementing for the new topic. And if I do it enough times, it's going to work out. Uh, now, in terms of what we output, I'm only outputting the, the B matrix. For each topic, what are the high probability words? Now, of course, there's 50,000 words, so I'm only printing the highest ones. Most languages have a MATLAB called word clouds. Word cloud, it's going to give me the highest probability words in that topic. And the highest, highest five ones are in red. And uh, or something that crosses the threshold. So you can see here, it's not all the words, obviously. It's the highest probability. So I have six topics. You can try 50 topics, 100 topics, be more plots. Um, to understand A matrix, you would have to go a little bit by guessing what the topics are about, right? If you see, how do you understand A matrix? You look at a particular document. You look at the high probabilities and say the high probabilities are topics one and two. So I look and then, aha, uh -huh, one and two. It's about space, university, and research, and about computer science hardware. Then I looked at, I, I have to read that document with human eyes and say, does that make sense? Is this document really about research and Earth and space and climate change, perhaps, and, and about computer hardware? Would, would, as a human, would I treat those two topics as the highest probability topics in that document? If somebody asked me, hey, what's this document about? Would I say those two things at first? If the answer is yes, maybe it worked because the highest probabilities are on the topics that make sense. If the answer is no, that's about World War II, nothing to do with the SCSI hard drives, then it didn't work. So in a, B, it's easy to see visual what's about. A, you need to do a little human uh, you know, matching to see how it works. So that's the homework, 5B. You're also going to have to do sampling in there, which we didn't talk about yet. And as I look at the clock, chances are we're not going to do that today. Um, but if we understand the pipeline of LDA, that's a big progress. So what else I want to show you? Here's my code. My code does exactly what you saw in there with this A and B decrease counts and all that right here. But it also has a parameter that says, you, run the, you want to run the MATLAB LDA instead? It runs much faster, so I set that to 1. And uh, I'm running it on the Sonnets data set that's very small. 
it's going to produce the figures. This is not the figures you saw because it's a different data set. That's the Shakespeare sonnets. If you are an expert at Shakespeare's, you can tell maybe from Shakespeare. I, I'm not at all. Uh, I don't understand that old English language. So, but, but if you are, you can say, hey, are the Shakespeare sonnets breakable into these six roughly topics? Maybe we need more like 50 topics to break those sonnets into. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, what is this? that comes out out of this LDA model in MATLAB. 154 sonnets times six topics, what is that? A. That's A matrix. And what is two, nine, five, six times six? That's six topics times, that's how many words are in those sonnets, so it's a really small data set. That's probably B transpose. So when you talk about LDA, Shakespeare is a side thing in here. They think that matters A and B, those two matrices. So you need to have access to those. It does other things too, many parameters. So I, I could run the code without this. I just show you my code. Um, I don't want to do that. What I'm printing here is um, the counts. I'm printing, I think, either the, I think this is the A matrix. So for all documents, if I look at, at each iteration, this is the matrix A. So I have. 154 documents times six topics. What I notice here uh, is that this, this seems to be a heavy topic. This is unnormalized, but still, looks like this topic is much more dominant across all, 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 all documents, right? Everybody seems to have a higher count. Is this true that this topic on average seems like a high count topic? I mean, somehow a lot of documents are about this, whatever that is, right? Seems to have much more counts on that and uh, perhaps that's not ideal, right? When you see one topic having high counts, it doesn't do enough differentiation on other things. But it's possible that I have six topics uh, if I choose the number six. And then a topic is common in all documents. It's like kind of the main thing and the other five are side things. So the other five may be more sparse and one is like the common topic across all of them. So here's a few things to go further with this. Could that be like a, just a, a topic of stop words, for example, with LDA? I kill the like stop that? words. Yes, easily could be. Okay. And then uh, I think, uh, I don't know if that worked very well, but my manual uh, thing here says take the stop words out, right? Okay, but it's like all the shared words. Right, so that's okay. probably more like common language Shakespeare, Shakespeare used that's yeah. not taken out or some particular theme that they were, especially in Old English, some Old English words don't count as stop words because nobody heard of them. Uh, maybe it's some artifacts like that. I think it makes more sense to run it on different things, sonnets, 20 news groups, email, to see what happens. Also play with the number six. Maybe six is the wrong number. Maybe it's more like 10. So how do you go further? And some of this will go further. This is, I think, the main paper we can follow. This is the best introduction into LDA that I found. Um, uh, somebody which is rather, try to teach it rather than to discover it. So it's not, the main authors of LDA are famous computer scientists. Some of them at Columbia. Uh, but but they, it's impossible to read that stuff to make sense of it. So this guy put an effort to make it nice. Uh, this is the generative model. This is the how to think of probabilities. This is the Gibbs sampling, iteratively taking one of the joint conditional to the others. And this is those derivations, the four points. This is the main uh, ZI conditional. And then it, it does, in here, like that's the first two points that we've done there somewhere. These are more like definitions. Those two points, the other two, they do it with integrals, but they're not that hard to follow. This is exactly the math we did last time. When we say if you pick the, the, what the trick is that you have a product of those phi, that's as the P, the generator. When you do that times that, you just add up the, you just add up the, the exponents there, and you get the same family of function in the exponent. So this is exactly the math we did before, but written with integrals, it's a continuous distribution. 
So conceptually, is the same. And the only part that you need to un untangle is the one that's also in the pseudo code. How do you get from here to here? This into this is just an easy derivation. These B functions are this factorial, so that's, that's no problem. But why is this that? That's a little like following from the other thing. So for people interested in math, we can take this apart a little later. But then, here's the LDA, which is pretty much the LDA that it's in my pseudo code. This is that DSD distribution after the, the taking the, the counts out, right? After taking the counts out, that's exactly the DSD, and then sample from that, update the topics, and be done. Now, for the people who need something softer than this, so if, if this is, I, I would say that's the main thing with LDA, that paper to read, LDA simplified. But there is a person who wrote an entire book trying to understand this in far more detail. So I would say this is definitely undergraduate level or lower. So if you struggle a lot with density and probabilities and how they work, they have chapters here uh, for basic uh, you know, distributions. Like if we don't know what the distribution is, how do you flip a coin three times, what do you get? So no shame in saying, I don't know how to do that. This is taking you really at the end of the high school. So I would say, by definition, if you want to look into this, look for that LDA simplified paper. Maybe you can read that and ask me some questions and figure it out. But if you really need, okay, I don't understand Bernoulli, I don't understand the factorial, I don't understand the binomial coefficient, all that stuff, then you go read this book, which does the whole thing with LDA simplified, but it spends a lot of time dealing with the prerequisites. So eventually, at chapter six, after so many pages, it does the LDA. So again, I think that's a, these derivations are copied from the other paper, no difference. But I think it does a good job into doing LDA as a, say, course project for an undergraduate that will spend two months on it. Half of the course will be the whole LDA with distributions and that. We don't spend two months, but as a, going back to understand more details in terms of prerequisite, I recommend this particular book if you don't have the chance to take a course in statistics. So that's this one. That's effectively pretty much what we follow. Here's another good paper that's, uh, uh, there's many papers and tutorials. I like this one, explaining the Gibbs sampler. It's not the easiest, but I think you guys can read it. This is definitely within, again, if we have some background statistics. So here's why I like it so much. The first example they give, example number one, is actually beta binomial distributions. So the first example here says one of the conditional is binomial. That is how do you generate words given the die generator. You flip the die or the coin so many times. And then how do you pick the generator? Well, you pick it from a beta distribution with counts. So the first example they give is exactly our example. And then they run this experiment in here that they say that's a multi that's the multi Dirichlet family of distribution. So f of x, it, what happens is if you pick the generator and then you generate the sample overall, what kind of distribution you have. So if you replace this gamma with factorials, that's exactly the distribution we had last time on the board. Although we, we written it with factorials, right? Remember the coefficient and all that? So it's, a, it's beta binomial, so it's two outcomes, heads and tails. And not just that, they're running as an experiment. The, the, there's white and black bars here. The one of the bars, I forgot which one, this is here. One of them corresponds to sample directly from the multi, from the beta binomial distribution, the x's. And the other one corresponds to Gibbs sampling, sampling alternatively from the binomial and the beta, like doing Gibbs sampling. And what they're showing is that the counts pretty much align. So the Gibbs gives you the same distribution in terms of the empirical outcomes, like you sample from the, the joint distribution. Okay. So this is an experiment that says if you do Gibbs back and forth versus if you sample directly from that distribution right there, 
they can do it in this case. We couldn't do it with the topics, but in this case, they can do it. You get that. They give you another example with an exponential family. Example number two, somewhere in here, that you can follow another example. And again, the bars with Gibbs pretty much align with the distributions you expect. But they also give a proof. This is the easiest proof I've seen for Gibbs. It's a very elementary, incomplete, and actually incorrect, but that's the one I would do if I want to know, hey, how do I know this guy is correct? So they take you over, let's say, a confusion matrix with two variable. This is like effectively 1, 0, 1, 0, P1, P2, P3, P4 are the four probabilities of the joints. This is the conditionals, very easy to compute, that given x being 1, what's the property of y being 1? That's a very basic. And they show in here, <coughs> for this very basic example, that what happens with the Gibbs, that the sample of the outcome, it follows what we call, we're going to do this next time, Markov property. Markov chain property. It says, uh, eventually, the, dis the effective sampling distributions must have the property when you multiply with the, with the matrix, you get the same distribution. We're going to see at Markov models that this implies if it's a stationary distribution and it has to be the correct distribution of X. That's the only way. So effectively, this iterative Gibbs process, we can show for some basic examples that leads to an equation that forces the outcome of the distribution to be the correct one. Now, we didn't do Markov processes, but we're going to do them next time after after the sense giving. So I like this paper because it's very elementary, very easy to read, describes exactly the example Gibbs sampling that we need, and provides a very simplified proof of why Gibbs actually give you the correct distribution. Right, so what we didn't do, this is not what I want to show you, what we didn't do is these ideas that, okay, how do I sample from a distribution? Like, we talk about how to compute that distribution. But once I have it, how do I pick an item out of it? So there's four sampling methods we're going to do. One is we talk about pick that R and inverse the CDF somehow, typically with binary search. But some of the CDFs are invertible functions on paper, so you can compute the inverse directly. The other one that's in the notes is called rejection sampling. You're going to have to implement it. I would like to show you rejection sampling right now. It's going to take me uh, 30 seconds, OK? If we skip the math. How do I sample from a distribution? This is the CDF, right? Cumulative distribution function. So it has to end up at 1. These are the outcomes. This is the probability, it's cumulative. What did we say about uh, inverse sampling? You pick an R uniform, and then, boom, that's the CDF at minus 1 inverse of R. This is the outcome. That could work for continuous distributions of discrete. Pick a uniform R from 0 to 1, inverse the CDF, or do binary search, see what you get. That's inverse sampling. In rejection sampling, what we do is we pick the x. So reject sampling. Select x in the space here. And now in this bar at x, so let's say that's max, select, say, r uniform on x vertical bar between 0 and max. So select an r here, let's say r. If r is bigger than f of x, so the f is actually like this. This is the f, which is the PDF. Because the cumulative only goes up, but the actual distribution doesn't always go up. Reject. If r is smaller than f of x, so you see where r is, and this is where f of x is. 
only if R follows in here, then accept. That's the Jason sample. So I pick a sample that's possible. I look at the probability. I sample from zero to that. If I, my, my uniform sample fits below the probability, I accept it. If, if it's above, I reject it. And I keep doing it until I get five samples, 10 samples, 20 samples. So that's another method to pick from a non-uniform distribution. Inversion and rejection sample, those two. I'm going to show you some more complicated methods for sampling that's not easy at all, just in case you need them. You won't need them for this, but you know, it's nice to know. So we didn't do that, but I think you have plenty of stuff that you can work on for the homework. Uh, and you have Formal 5A to finish very soon. And uh, I think we have everything in place for LDA, but I still will think need, need uh, one more lecture to clarify everything that needs to be clarified by next week. Let's see. All right. So happy Thanksgiving. And um,